Hey, everybody. This is Kevin Kautzman with the podcast Get This. It's the show about things people love. And I'm joined by polymath, man of the world, renaissance man, Dan Barrett. Dan, how are you? I am excellent. Thank you very much. You said polymath, and I was like, oh, no, he thinks I love math, and I don't. <laughs> but uh, right. Poly- yeah, Polyamorous for math. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, all poly cool with a bunch of numbers, and it's great. Uh, no, but I, that was that was a lovely introduction, and I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I don't so I don't give the the polymath uh, intro to to just anybody, but you you really do do many things. And uh, you know, again, this is this being the show about things people love. Mm. What is it you want to talk about lately? Uh, you know, what is it that's it's uh, it's occupying your mind? Well, I currently, I'm kind of splitting my time up. You know, you said I do a bunch of different things and, and I do, and I've, I've kind of traditionally walled those things off pretty, pretty strongly. And lately I'm, I'm kind of integrating back into one kind of giant Voltron person. So about 30% of my time I've been spending running a, a, a marketing agency. So I run an online marketing agency. About 30% of my time I've been spending on music. So I have a variety of, of musical projects and um, a record that's going to come out this year. And then about 30% of my time I've been spending kind of on a, on a blog and a, and, a, and a kind of coaching program that's really, really kind of designed to explore you know, mental models and accelerated learning and, and knowledge management for creative people. And then 10% of the time, you know, like 8% of the time I spend with my kids and then 2% of the time I sleep. Right. That's, right. I think, 100%. And sure. you, you don't like math. And I don't like math. So I don't, can't remember, and this is not an exaggeration, <laughs> right. what numbers I said. So I don't know if it adds up to 100, it's, but I tried. I did my Yeah, math. that's all right. I'll go back and I'll, you know, I'll do some voiceover for you to make sure it sounds yeah. right. Please yeah. uh, show my work in, in audio <laughs> right. format. Yeah, right. But yeah, so many things. And so uh, obviously, Have a Nice Life, Blackwing, uh, mm-hmm. Giles Corey, the uh, AdWords Nerds. Uh, dot com and uh, am I missing anything? Oh, no less than dot com as well is the yeah. mental models lifestyle, and that's that's how you and I connected because you needed something mm. done for this uh, COVID risk uh, assessment. Um, we built a micromort calculator. Yeah, so at the beginning of this year, um, you know, at the beginning of the year, I had started this project that was called No Less Than. So yeah, it's at no less than dot com, and I, I was like, you know, I really want to you know, the kind of the way I think about a lot of things is if there is something I want for myself, like, so for example, I really wanted to get better at writing. I really wanted to, um, you know, practice my hand at this craft of writing that I'd always really liked, but never really practiced in a consistent way. And I also really wanted to, um, I really wanted to internalize this like collection of mental models. I had been gathering for a long time. Like a long, many years ago now, I read this book that was called Poor Charlie's Almanac, a collection of writings and speeches from Charlie Munger, who is Mm -hmm. a Warren Buffett's partner, Berkshire Hathaway. Right. And one of Munger's big, you know, kind of ideas is you collect the best mental models from all the fields of learning and different industries and all different parts of life. And you know, you hang them on what he calls a lattice work. So he's like, you know, you don't just have the model, you got to understand how it connects to everything. And so ever since I read that book, I'd had this Evernote notebook, this sort of like thing that sat on my computer that was called the lattice. Mm -hmm. And it was every time I had like, you know, I found some kind of cool mental model or some cool idea, I would toss it in there and I'd kind of just forget about it. right? Right. Like Evernote is essentially a giant pile on my digital desk that I don't really think about. And so I was like, you know, I have this thing. And for, for several years, I'd really wanted to dedicate time to going through it and learning it. And, you know, if you just kind of say you want to do something like that, it's very easy to say it. It's very hard to fit it in. Like I, I have two kids, I have a wife, I have a business. I, right, you know, I like right. uh, There's music. There's so, so much. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of stuff. So I, I was just never really doing it. And so, you know, I said, how can I put myself on the hook for this? Uh-huh. Right? So how can I build a project or a thing that I can put out to the public? It's going to have a deadline. It's going to make me do this. And so that's what no less than was. 
And I basically every Wednesday I was sending out an email called better questions. And it's like one question a week kind of getting into this kind of like, you know, how do I think a little bit more rationally be a little bit more productive, you know, just move through life in, in a better way and kind of understand what was going on around me. And that this started in January. Right. And um, this year is also the year I turned 40. So I turned 40 in March oh. and then also in March, you know, COVID happened and, right, uh, you know, right. coronavirus. Right. I don't know if you've heard just of it. The, right. Yep. Just the descent of doom. <laughs> yeah. I mean, basically, uh, it was like Kobe Bryant died. And uh, then the entire year has been downhill uh, from there. Yes. So, you know, in, in a, you know, this was the first legitimate, and it, I mean, it, it, see, it feels weird to say this because obviously there's been a lot, you know, it, there hasn't been a year where nothing dramatic has happened, but sure. this was really the first big existential crisis that has occurred while I'm kind of the CEO of a business and I've got mm -hmm. these two young kids. Yes. So yeah. I was very set on figuring out for myself, like, okay, like it took me by surprise, like totally by surprise. And I was like, you know, why, why did that happen? Like, why did I not see this coming? How do I think about it now? How do I think about, you know, we were like, do we, stock up on toilet paper or, you know, all these right. questions. And so I started writing the, the series that ended up being, it ended up being almost, almost three months long of one email a week, really thinking about how do you define what your personal like ex existential risk is? And how do you define what the worst case scenario is for yourself? And how do I think about problems where it's not just about what I do, it's about what other people do and how do I predict what other people will do and how do I predict how the world will react to these massive events mm -hmm. and took me on this really long transformative kind of journey through, you know, st statistical analysis and game theory and, and all these psychology and all these different things. And so that's kind of what, at the end of it, I, I sort of ended it with, here is a checklist of things you can do to just go through these mental models and think, can the, the question I set about to answer for myself was like, can I go to brunch again? Like, when can yeah, I go to brunch? Yeah, you know? right. yeah brunch. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, yeah. I miss going to brunch. I haven't seen my mom in like three months. People like, who know me, people who know me know that I'm obsessed with brunch. I have tweets on record saying it's my religion. <laughs> I, I know it's a silly thing, but man, oh man. It's objectively Western, the best. Western civilization exists to protect brunch. Yes, you will exactly. know things are good when brunch comes back. It and is you, the pinnacle of industrial civilization. You have enough free time to go to brunch. There's a weekend. It's beautiful. So yeah, it's 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 wonderful. And, but I was like, when can we do this again? Like, when is it ever going to happen? And so I, do, I it's literally a checklist. Like, and I go through the checklist now every single month. My anxiety about COVID is, is way down. I feel like I, oh, wow. I know what I want to do about it. So part of that was, hmm. you know, I, 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 we reached out, we connected on Twitter because I, I said, you know, this, this mental model of the micromort, which is basically a one in a million chance of dying, mm -hmm. which you can kind of use as a, a universal scale of risk, right? So, right. you know, going, you know, getting in a barrel and going over Niagara Falls, that's a certain number of micromorts yeah, and yeah. smoking a cigarette, it's a certain number of micromorts and eating a banana is a certain number of micromorts because I didn't know this bananas have trace amounts of radiation in them. So oh, great. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, uh, eating a hundred bananas is equivalent to one micromort. So there you right. go. So okay. watch out. You know, so, so you can, you can measure these things. And so I, I wanted a calculator that would just do this really easily and simply because it was kind of hard to figure out. And you did a fantastic job building it for me and it's been awesome and I use it regularly. So yeah, thank you very much for that. that Brilliant. Great. Yeah. And thanks for including me in the project. It, it was a yeah. real pleasure and on a, kind of a funky way for us to connect too, because I'm, I'm, I'm certainly a fan of the music. I see the, yeah. uh, the Giles Corey uh, vinyl behind you. Yeah, back there. That yes, to me, there. I'm going to be frank and, and, uh, and whatever, I'm going to be candid. That to me, the design of that vinyl is some of the coolest stuff that I've, that I've seen. It is just, when I pulled that out, I was like, this is not just the album itself. The album is, yeah. a, to my mind, it's a masterpiece. I love it. Um, it's, it's the, it's the dark soundtrack to a movie that hasn't been made. That's, you know, <laughs> like and, that. and yeah, yeah, wonderful. Cool. it's like, Oh, it's really cool. And, um, uh, and very uh, difficult, which I love. I love yeah. putting it on for people and they go, 
what are what are you playing? It's a sit down. It's a sit down and listen record. You know, yeah, it's yeah, uh, that's it's not, okay. It's not yeah. like background music to the party or whatever. But oh. I love it. I love it. And the, but the vinyl. So, but again, what I love about it as an object is is how much clearly time and effort and thought uh, went into it and and the writing in it too both that album and the and the the, the first have a nice life album mm -hmm. uh, death consciousness came they come with books don't they yeah they both have like pretty significant kind of booklets or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. them kind of hefty things with it um yeah i mean that was you know again kind of an expression of me wanting to write i mean those, yeah. those are both about 10 years old at this point but, sure right um but you know it, it's i've always loved writing kind of the desire to write and i love i love kind of world building and, and yeah all our our musical projects have kind of you know there's sort of like a, a weird sort of like marvel cinematic universe but for depressing bands kind of thing going on where they're all <laughs> yeah. connected one way or the other <laughs> right and at this point you know at, at, at that time it was a real you know we weren't on the label or anything we, we we pressed everything ourselves that was our thing for for a very long time and then uh you know so it was always just we were doing it for ourselves we were doing it because we enjoyed it you yeah. know we 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 really liked that stuff and i i always missed the experience of um, you know, cause I, I lived through, you know, the death of the record store, right. Uh -huh. And sort of the trip the you know, Same. when I was in college was when Napster came out. Sure. And, so, yeah. you know, I, I always missed like the experience of going through the liner notes and kind of reading, really reading everything in the mm -hmm. record and being like, who's that? And you know, what's going mm -hmm. on? And yeah. you know, there are weird jokes in it and stuff. And then, <laughs> and, or, or even getting like, record catalogs and being like, you know, who, what bands are like other bands and how are bands connected? And so we always wanted to do this kind of, you know, like essentially for someone that really wanted to spend extra time with the record, there would be little things they could find and little connections they could make. And, um, and we've just kept that going because now there are actually people who want to hear it. At the time, there was nobody that wanted to listen to it, uh, but now now people like it. So now now it's fun because I can I can do it, and I'm like I know there's an audience for this, and I, I can kind of put things in there that I know will will please those people, and it's fun. Yeah. How did the how did it feel crossing that transom? Uh, both you know I guess from from that period of time where you were toiling in obscurity to. Mm. Uh, a degree of fame? Yeah, I mean, well, the answer is it, it doesn't, very gradually is the answer to that, right? So it, we, the, the kind of trajectory of the band was, you know, we, we were a home recording project. We never played shows. It was just my friend Tim and I, it's when we were doing, uh, when Have a Nice Life had started. And, you know, we're just recording in a bedroom. I'm burning CDRs. So, you know, I'm literally burning CDs and we would print the right. thing at Kinko's or FedEx uh, or whatever. And, you know, and just <laughs> physically hand them to people or mail them to people who didn't ask for them. You know, it's like that was the thing. And this was wow. sort of, yeah, at the, at the tail you, end. Of, you're talking about death consciousness for that. Yeah, I'm talking about death consciousness. Right. So, Jeez. you know, at the, at the tail end of kind of blog culture, right? It was, it was, a, mm -hmm. it was blogs were the predominant online media yeah sure time. everybody had their live journal or their yeah exactly yeah, live journal right, and, right yeah and i still know that this guy uh chris who <laughs> had like a live journal that reviewed us like very early yeah. and so it was very much like i found people who had reviewed records that i liked that had live journals and blogs on sure. com or whatever yeah. and, and um just sent them stuff mm -hmm. and what ended up happening was mm -hmm we would have these weird sort of reality puncturing moments. So I remember we'd been doing that for about a year. Um, no one had any idea. It was it like impossible. You had to email me to get my, I don't, I don't even think we had a PayPal, you know, you had to like sure. send me cash in the mail or something. It was like impossible to do this, this whole Jeez. process. And we ended up getting reviewed in, I want to say it was like Italian spin so it was like some, it was like Spin Magazine in Italy or like the equivalent of it. Yeah. And they were, it was like best albums of the year or whatever. And we were like number two. Under <laughs> Wait, you know. Yeah. It was like under under Portishead. Portishead. Oh, oh yeah. Record. Okay. Yeah, All right. Year. And then us. And I remember reading it and being like, oh no, like they <laughs> think we're a real band. They think, 
you can get this record anywhere because you couldn't get it. It was impossible to wow. get it. Yeah. And so, you know, we had, I ended up getting like, we ended up just for like a year after that, it was only Italian people that liked this for a really long time. So shout out to the country. Hey, Thank bueno, you very much. Bon, I don't even yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, maybe, <laughs> a more, I don't know. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, awesome. You know, it, was, uh, it, was, it was interesting because very early on, it taught me that, oh, when you're on the internet, nothing matters. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter mm. that nobody know. You know, we'd never played a local show. Uh, yeah. I, I live in Connecticut. Nobody in Connecticut knew we existed. Um, just didn't matter, right? Didn't right. matter. Right. And so um, from there, it's been very gradual. Like we, we it's, it's been very slow and steady. When we, um, when we finally decided to press vinyl for the first time, so I pressed vinyl, of this record that had only ever been on CDR. And I wow. didn't have the masters. I only had like crappy MP3 files. So mm -hmm. we just pressed it to vinyl, even though that makes zero sense. Wow. And, um, hmm. you know, I was doing everything myself and we, I think we sold out of like 500 copies or something. And I was not ready for it. I wasn't prepared for it at all. It again, took me completely by surprise. I thought we'd sell a hundred. So it's just one of these things where we kept finding that there were more people that were into the record. Now we've sort of entered this weird third phase, right? That first phase was absolutely no, no one knows who we are. Mm -hmm. The second phase is, hey, some people know who we are. We, we're kind of like this nice cult band status. That's still where it is. But now we're in this new phase of music where um, like, for example, because of things, platforms like Spotify, yeah. we will get recommended to people or YouTube will recommend videos. That's how, that's how I got turned on. Yeah. Spotify. That is the, the majority of people that find the band. Now it's this algorithmic recommendation mm -hmm. engine. And, yep. and then the zoomers, whatever you want to call them, very young people who I appreciate very much. Yes. You know, it's, for whatever reason, the, the record has been very meme friendly. So there are people who just make memes about the record or death consciousness memes or Dan Barrett memes, which is very odd. It's very strange. But, but it, w what occurred to me, you know, in the beginning, it was, it was weird because I'm like, you know, it, people are doing stuff with your literal likeness and it's sort of out of your control in a weird way. Um, but then what I realized very quickly was that's a huge way that that is essentially the equivalent of your older brother handing you a CD that he thought you would like. Right. Because right. what always happens, and this will happen every single time, someone will post a meme about the record and somebody will be like, "Who? what record is that? And they'll say, it's always have a nice life, death of consciousness. And then they'll go on Spotify or whatever, and they'll just pull it up and they'll listen to it. Or they'll go on YouTube and they'll listen to it. And the first, the first two tracks on that album are so captivating, the contrast and then the, the banger with, with mm. Blood Hail. Yeah, it's, it's got it's a real just, slow opener. It's not like a, it, it's not like a, yeah. I don't know, it doesn't come out swinging in, in the way you might sure. expect. So it's, um, it reminds me, the opening track reminds me of the B-side of Low. And then, oh yeah, yeah with yeah. that kind of, and then, and then you just go into that other thing. Yeah. It's a nice, yeah. it's a nice lull, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, it is just a very different world in terms of how people find music. And so mm -hmm. this record, you know, we put out several records since then, but it, yeah, that's course, still yeah. our most popular record. And sure. it's primarily because it's popular because it's popular because it was popular. So now it's popular because it yeah. gets recommended, which makes right. it popular, which makes right. it popular. Sure. So it, it's this very odd um, way of, of kind of discovering music, but it's, it's kept us, it, we still have people that discover the band every day and it's amazing. Well, so, and there are some people who are truly obsessed with it. I, I recall at, uh, the, the one show in Brooklyn, there was a, there was a guy who uh, had, we were, we were hanging around in the back and he was showing off all the the vinyl versions that he had. He must have had <laughs> eight different versions that I was like, oh, okay, guy. <laughs> yeah, it. yeah. Well, it. and it's that's another right. thing. It's it's really intersected very interestingly with this resurgence of uh, like collector culture and record collector culture. And I think a lot of people, because music is so digital, and we right. all have so much music, that's just kind of this amorphous presence in our life and. People want to have a physical thing. They yeah. want to own it. Absolutely. And so 
you know, the vinyl still sells. It's still in print. It's 10 years old. It still sells. Yeah. It, it'll sell out every time we print it. it it's, it's incredible. Once I got into vinyl, people picked up on that and started giving it to me as a gift. And it's such a wonderful gift. Uh, my yeah, my buddy, Brad Kelly, got me the, the Great Manic Street Preachers record, uh, The Holy Bible. Yeah, he got me that cool. on vinyl. Great. Yeah, and on one side of it, it has uh, LSD Jesus. And on the other side, it has like these Soviet symbols. And it's just perfect. You just, yeah, it's like the, the record's new. These are it cliches, makes it, right? It, but it's it, like- Yeah, it's a very yeah. different experience. And uh, it's fun. And it's, and it's a fun, you know, as- um, as an artist, it's a fun medium. There's a lot of possibilities you could do with like designing the packaging and doing stuff with the packaging. And um, I just went through that with, um, so for Blackwing yeah. is a solo project that I have that's mostly yep. synth driven and electronic and um, a little dancier than have a nice life or whatever. I mean, dance is maybe not the right word, but it, a, little, a little more upbeat than that. And uh, I just got to go and I was like, this is a very internet album. Cause I went, I had a, a couple different concepts for art and I went on Twitter and I just followed a bunch of illustrators and found threads and found people that were like, Hey, let's do a thread. Uh, I found a thread. There was someone who was like, Hey, s- people who draw scary stuff thread. And there was like, post your art. And I'm literally just going through the threads and then direct messaging people that I like and being, Hey, can I commission a piece from you? Amazing. And just, yeah. And so yeah. all the artwork from the record was commissioned from people I found online and it's amazing. It, that, it's incredible. I didn't know that. that. That's, that's brilliant. Do you have a title for the, the new black one? Yeah. So it's called, it's called no moon. It'll be out this year. Uh, it's coming out on the Flenser, which is the record label that we release all our stuff with now. And um, it'll be out on vinyl this year. So it's, um, and I just, just, just sent like the, the kind of like mock-up copy of the album art and stuff to, um, to Flenser a couple weeks ago, but it is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for it. It's going to, it's going to be good. I think it might be like two full records. It's really okay. long. Wow. So it's uh all right. It'll be, I had extra time because of COVID. That's the right. I blame. I okay. Blame. Yeah. It's the, yeah. the COVID album. Yeah. Basically it is. Yeah. It's like the quarantine. I think a album. lot of people are going to have that quarantine album. Uh, that's all right. If you've got something. For images and designs. Oh, that's not me. Sorry. I don't know. Here uh, they're not here anymore. Yeah. Sorry, man. Uh, not at all. The demands yeah. of, uh, of modern life. You yeah. may have heard my, my newborn son uh, wailing in the background a few minutes ago. Oh, no. So I didn't hear it all. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, just said I, I've had kids, so yeah. I just completely filtered out. I can't yeah. hear kids crying. Right, right. Okay, okay. No worries. Um, you know, the thought occurred to me. Well, first, I should say, you know, it's, it's easy to talk about the, maybe these older records that, that people are more familiar with. But the new Have a Nice Life Record, Have a Nice Life Record, I can't say it, Have a Nice Life Record is pretty awesome. Yeah, I like it too. Yeah. It was, we, it was our, so what ended up happening was mm-hmm. when, when the 10th anniversary of Death Consciousness happened, we got invited to play Roadburn, which is a big festival in the Netherlands. And we, we got invited met. to perform the record front to back for the yeah. 10th anniversary, which was amazing. And we got to play in front of more people than I ever seen in a room before. And it was awesome. So, and just the people at Roadburn, if, if anybody listening to this ever gets sort of interested in, in kind of underground music or they want to go check it out, it is an, inc- an incredible festival. It's very well run. Everyone is so nice. It is like the ultimate, not this. It's like everyone's scary looking and they're the nicest people you've ever met. Right? That happens so often. Oh, these hardcore people, these metal people, they yeah. take no guff at the shows. If anybody gets out of line, it's like, yo. No, you can't. No one's littering. It, no yeah. one's doing anything wrong. Like, it's like, you know, people are very responsibly drinking. It's a lovely environment. And just a, a, in, um, it's in Tilburg, which is a, a very nice town sort of not, you know, it's not in Amsterdam or whatever. It's in kind of, you know, sort of out there in the Netherlands. And uh, it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. So, you know, we got to play that. So we got the word about that almost a year and a half in advance. Because you have to remember, we had never really played. This is leading into another question I had. So okay. I'm going to ask it right now because yeah. it strikes me that you hear a lot from bands who are, wildly successful, big record labels. There are a lot of promotion and they're stuck playing the same songs over and over and over and over again. Mm. Uh, an interview with 
I think it was the guitarist from Mastodon comes to mind. And he was just grousing about the way that they, they get run around. He was clearly not happy with the, mm. the major label. And it, it strikes me that you probably don't have that problem. You must love to, to, to put these together. And it, what was that like? So you had it's, to play it out and now come and play the entire album 10 years later? Yeah, 10 years later. And it's the exact opposite problem, which is at no time have we ever performed this live or did we ever think we would perform it live? <laughs> so it, it yeah. would be like, okay, well, let's play everyone's favorite song. Great. What are the parts? Nobody knows. <laughs> this part has a tuba in it because I recorded a tuba on a keyboard on my computer. We can't play a tuba in real life. <laughs> yeah. Do yeah. you bring the tuba keyboard? Like what? it was just this complete, and it was like, do we have a drummer? How many people do we have? It was, it was com complete. I was kind of a, kind of a nightmare because I was like, there's no way we can do it to sound exactly like it's no. what's supposed to sound. Sure. Right? So right. it was always like, let's translate it as much as possible to a live setting. So we got um, a bunch of musicians, the amazing musicians like Rich Otero, uh, Mike Cameron, um, you know, uh, th these people, uh, Tim McCuga, obviously, uh, Joe Streeter, these guys who we, we kind of knew from just around or we have been friends with for a while who were, you know, playing pretty consistently. And we're, you know, we're like, let's just come together and make it, make it a full band experience. We had live drums, even though like, you know, um, the band when, when we record is just, was just Tim and I. So all the drums were always digital. So, you know, or drum machine or whatever. So we, we, we needed to do that for the first time, have a live drummer. And we really focused on the live experience of it, making a, a very intense live show. And, um, you know, I think what ended up happening was, you know, there were so many people who had been lit. Again, the, the record was 10 years old at that point. There were a lot of people who had been listening to that record for, you know, almost a decade. And what ended up happening, I, I sort of equated it to, you know, if you played video games as a kid, you have memories of like your favorite video game. Like for me, it was like, I remember like, okay, like GoldenEye on the- Oh, the GoldenEye, Super, you know, yeah. the reason to get the 64, you had Yeah, exactly. It was like- You the, and your friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's like, okay, you're like running around and you're shooting people, you got- Throwing mines. Games. Yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> you just remember it's this amazing game. And if you go look at it today, it looks like hot garbage. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah. It makes no yeah. sense. Everyone, there's like a triangle, you know, it's just like ridiculous. But you remember it mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. context of the first time you, ex you experienced it. Yeah. So what ended up happening was we would play these sort of like live equivalents of, so a good example is there's a song called The Big Gloom on the records. My personally, my favorite song. And the way that it was recorded was um, there's this like really thick uh, sort of guitar sound. And what it is, is me playing bass lines over and over and over again, looped on top of each other. So I would record one bass line, then I would start over and record a different one, mm. and then start over and record a different one, and then start over yeah. and record a different one. So right. it's like six levels of different parts. How do you do that? Yeah, and you can't, There's it's like physically possible to play it live. And you know, so we had to move a bunch of the bass parts to guitar, and you're sort of extrapolate, you know, uh, I'm not particularly well versed in music theory, but Tim, um, you know, is, you know, went to music school. Mike went to, you know, is incredibly versed in music theory. So is Rich. These are guys there who were very technical. So they were able to say, okay, you know, here's the chord that all these things are making and I can sort of adjust, you know, transpose it down here. And so they're playing in a different way, maybe a different key, maybe it's on guitar, but it sounded enough like the record that when people heard it live, it just translated in their heads, right? So for most people, the experience of hearing it live is, I was so worried that people were gonna say like, oh, it's not like this, or mm. this part used to have, you know, a dog sure. barking in the background and now it's not there or whatever. But instead, people just got very wrapped up in the moment. I did too, I, I mean, I for probably like our first five shows, I was crying every single night on stage, just like very overwhelming. I was at one of them. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's I a was very not. Woman. I was not prepared for the the savagery of the mosh pit. I was not prepared for the intensity. Yeah, well, yeah. If, if you've never experienced a sad mosh before, it's real. <laughs> it's real wild. 
we got a show title, an episode title, Sad yeah, Moss. Yeah, Sad Moss. Yep. Yep. Done. Sad Moss, that's, Sad Moss. Yeah, that's, in the, uh, that's in the can right now. We got the Yeah, title. you know, it's... Yeah. Uh, it, mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's, it, it was a very cathartic experience, I think, for a lot of people. It's cathartic for, for us, it's mm-hmm. cathartic for the audience, and it was a, a lot of fun. And so, you know, so the album that we put out, Sea of Worry, which is the most recent yeah. Have a Nice Life record, was with that live band. So we, we sort of wrote songs with them, recorded with them. And so it sounds different from other stuff, but um, to me, it was just such a fun experience, kind of, kind of changing it up a little bit, and also capturing that moment in our lives and um, what was a real special time for me. So, yeah. And Dan, where are you from originally? Are you, are you from Connecticut? I, well, you know, I was born in Massachusetts, but I've lived in Connecticut pretty much all my life uh, with some, you know, I, I went to school in Massachusetts. I lived in Japan for a little bit, but. Oh, you lived um, in Japan. Yeah. I, I went to school there for a little while um, because <laughs> I had a, a second major. So my trick was, here's my trick. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did not do particularly well in high school. I was kind of like a C student because I always felt like if I didn't want to do something, I wasn't going to do it. And I didn't want to be in school, so I wasn't going to do it. So it's kind of eh. And um, I sort of, uh, you know, I was going to apply to schools and I was very cocky. And I was like, I'm only going to apply to my safety school. I know I'm going to get into my safety school, which was UMass. So I'm like, I'll definitely get in and I don't have to worry about it. And uh, uh, it said, there was a little thing that said, you know, what is your incoming major? And you didn't have to put anything. Sure. But I put Japanese because in my junior year of high school, um, I had taken Spanish from second grade to junior year was like sort of a mandatory thing. Oh, in all second right. grade, you could have chosen French sure. or Spanish. I chose Spanish. That's quite good. It's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. No, it's amazing. Now, yeah. at the time, it was just 10 straight years of me hating Spanish because I was like, I'm bad at languages. I can't do it. They would love have a nice life in, in Mexico City. I'm sure they do. They probably do. They probably do. Uh, we get asked anyway. to go to Brazil every day. This is, is that like, right? This is the meme. I don't know. Everyone's like, come to Brazil. And you, it, you can never go to Brazil. I don't know why. No <laughs> band's ever been to Brazil as far sure. as I know. So. Sure. But um, so in any case, in junior year, you finally got the chance to switch out of Spanish, okay. which I had gotten straight D's in for 10 years. <laughs> and you could have chosen Japanese or Russian. Uh, so I was like, Japanese, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I had to choose one. Yeah, I think it was purely uh, like, yeah. where, you know, yeah, I'm like, why not? just picturing myself in Moscow, like, well, oh, Japan, that's fine. I knew uh, nothing about it. Right. I ended up really liking it, doing well in it, because I, again, it, it's mostly mental, right? I wasn't starting with the image of being bad at it. Um, uh-huh. So I liked it a lot. And so on my college application, I just put Japanese, because why not? Why not? And uh, I found out, la- I got in, I found out later that I almost didn't, I, I actually got a rejection letter and then later got an acceptance letter. The only reason I was accepted to college, the only reason is because the Japanese department was in danger of being cut from the school and they needed a certain number of majors and no one in my incoming class had declared Japanese a major except me. So they basically got me in to protect their jobs. Oh, that and is, that's how I got into school. That so then I, I did a year. Typical. Of, yeah, exactly. Okay. So, yep. you know, that's a little school advice for people out there. Right. There, but, are, uh, there are little angles. There are ways in. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, uh, it, you know, it was a very, being in Japan was a very formative experience. It was my first time out of the country and all that. But, um, you know, but other than that, yeah, from Connecticut, I'm, I'm very New England in my uh, disposition, I think. So, hmm. yeah, I like how, it here. How would you describe that? The, I, largely antisocial, but good hearted deep down. <laughs> so it, it, New England is kind of like, a, I, I would say like, you know, having been around different parts of the country, New Englanders are the, this. If I had to stereotype the the uh, disposition, it is largely pragmatic. So it's let's fix a problem. What's the problem? Fix the problem. And then it is also you don't bother me. I don't bother you. Everybody's happy. We, you know we don't have to talk. You, I can just nod. I can not give, give you the nod. You give me the nod. Everything's good. Now if yep. you don't give the nod, uh, I hate your guts. Then you got a right? problem. You have to give yep. the nod. Yeah. But I also don't want to talk. But if, for example, somebody falls down or, you know, you bang your head and you're on the floor, people will help you, right? There, there's, a, there's a social cohesion to New England that I think comes from the fact that 
nothing wants to grow here and it's kind of a hellscape a lot of the time. So, you know, we're, you got to stick together, but it's also like, Hey, life kind of sucks. So let's not, let's not stick together too much. It's just right. So, you know, that's my, that's how I view New England. I really like, like I like that description. And and of course the Giles Corey uh, project is named after a very famous New England uh, character. Yes. A lot of people. Giles Corey, Giles Corey was um, pressed to death for not selling out his wife into uh into you know basically admitting that he was involved with witchcraft or whatever um and uh i always thought that was a very a very cool kind of image and uh i just i really like the idea of i mean if you if you read about the historical giles corey he basically just a huge asshole Mm -hmm. which is amazing he's just this wonderful jerk that's just like so stubborn. He will not do it. You know, it's like, no, right. yeah. it just won't. Right. And I just, uh, I really like that. And I, you know, I think it's, um, it's one of those cool things that, that, you know, someone I don't get enough, I don't think gets enough play. We'll put it that way. So. Well, he's, yeah, he will now. Uh, the, that, because that, that album's fantastic. Are you going to bring another one out at some point? Yeah, I, I really want to. I think the, you know, I run into this issue where, um, I have all these different projects and they kind of come out of different parts of my life and they, they get very uh, situated in my mind with certain parts of my life. So Giles Corey, it was really kind of like my peak depressive period. It's probably the darkest period of my life and the music reflects that. And so if I'm going to do another one, yeah, part of it is, well, how do I translate that into what I do now? I mean, a, a big part of what I do is tapping into the more depressive parts of my personality, which, which never go away. I think a lot of creative people have this kind of, you know, not bipolar, I don't mean to put it that way, but this sort of like up and down pattern to their lives where, you know, I'm either super productive or I'm completely unproductive, right? It's one or the other. We used to have the word eccentric, extreme, yeah. intense, we don't right. have to medicalize it, you know. Exactly. If you want right. to, it's fine. But oh no, yeah. yeah, I, I think yeah. it's there's a, there's a certain rhythm to the way that I work and the way that I make stuff, and so you know the the challenge is always um, translating that in a way that's true to who I am now, while still being true to what that what people expect of the project, right? And so right. I'm very conscious of you know I've talked about in the for in, in the past about doing like. Giles Corey cosplay, where it's like, hey guys, you remember how it was real sad? Well, I'm real sad again, and give me your money. You they know? will like, read right through it. They'll people yeah. will read right through it. Exactly. I don't I don't think I can do that, right? And then mm. at the same time, um, you know, like, like so for example, Sea of Worry is a good example. I have a nice life record. It's a lot of themes about being anxious about my kids and about yeah. my family life and about stability and you know, those feelings of discomfort and angst or whatever you want to call it, they never go away, but they change. And, and hopefully, you know, I'm changing and maturing as a person. And, and I'm, I'm also much more capable as I get older of building systems and processes that help me compensate for my weaknesses, right? Like a big part of growing up is you learn what your own limitations are. And hopefully you build systems or you learn about yourself or you learn about your environment so that you can move past those limitations and grow. And so, you know, there was a time where, um, you know, like a depressive period would completely unmoor me for months at a time. And I will still have those periods, but they're much shorter, right? They're much, much shorter. Mm. Because I'm like, cool, I know this now. Like, I have a battle plan. Here's what happens. Here's what I can expect. Here's, you know, what what I should expect of myself and, you know, how I'm going to be either good to myself or I'm going to reduce right. the, the the weight on me in the, in the environment or, you know, I have people to support me or whatever it is. And so, you know, it, it's always a challenge as an artist to say, okay, cool. If you're coming out as a, as a, a certain project, people have certain expectations of. You want to meet those expectations. You, you don't want to just be a jerk for no reason. A big part of me also wants to deliberately be a jerk for no reason and completely flout people's expectations. That's a huge part of what I like. Uh, but, you know, but balancing that with, but even that. It could saying, be your, like, well, your kid A. The it, it, exactly, problem. yeah. But, right. but even, even going deliberately against it is 
again, it's playing to an audience, right? right? So how do I, instead of playing to the audience, play true to myself in a way that speaks to an audience? And so it, it, I, I had originally planned on doing a Jaws Quarry record before this Blackwing record that came out and sat down to work on it and just wrote a Blackwing record instead. So I was like, I guess I'm doing this now. I'm not doing that, I'm doing this. And so, you know, it's, um, it's one of those things where I really wanna do it, it's on my mind, I have a bunch of ideas for it, but in, unless it comes naturally to me, I'm not gonna force it. And so we'll, we'll see what happens. I think that's reasonable. And that was getting into territory for another question I wanted to ask, which would sure. be, yet for, for young people, the people who are memeing uh, arrowheads at you and mm. for Have a Nice Life and everything and you know, creating these funny things, who, who know their artists or have an inkling that they are, what advice do you have? What would you tell them? Yeah, so, yeah, and it's, it's been really interesting because I think through, through No Less Than, I've actually been working mm -hmm. with a lot of younger people and people who have a lot of creative ambition. And um, man, it is so fun to like tap into that again because as you get older, you're, it, you know, you're old and you're crotchety and everything's terrible or whatever. And, you know, young people have that kind of, that drive. It's really, really fun to be around. Um, you know, my advice is, you know, it's interesting because my creative advice, it kind of skews in two directions, right? There's the pure creation part of it. And then there's the, how does your creativity live in the world part of it, which is, to me, I borrow largely from what's worked from me in business, right? There's mm. art as a business, as yeah. making a living, as being known for something, which is largely a marketing problem. And then there is pure aesthetic creation, which is this thing is important and I need to make it, which I almost think like you can't think about the marketing at all and actually do it that way. Sure. So, you know, a lot of kind of what I work with people on is, is how they split the difference or how they navigate that, right? So, um, you know, for me, the, the kind of big things that come to mind are, for one, if, if you are like an artistic person or you, you have an aesthetic sensibility, or you have taste, or you have talent, right? The thing you hear in your head is never as, it's, it's never matches what comes out when you actually put pen to paper or you uh -huh. make a song or whatever, yeah. right? It, it is never the same. Mm -hmm. And young people, I think, agonize over that difference, right? It, they, they let it throw them off. They say like, well, I wanted to do this really cool thing. And um, I, I always just say like, you can't let your current limitations also limit your ambitions, right? Like your ambitions have to stay big because the bigger your ambitions, the more you have to push your comfort zone in order to get there. And the more you, the more you try, right? It's when you start playing it safe, that's when everything kind of dies out. And we think that like, well, if I can, if I just stay in my wheelhouse, I'll be really good at it, but it doesn't work that way, right? Like art, things that really resonate with people tend to be these things that are just kind of on the edge of like what you can do and what they're ready for. And, and that's kind of where you want to play as much as possible. I mean, I think the other thing is um, that I've really learned is that the individual is universal, right? So the more specific I get in my writing or my music, or even the, the, this kind of works in business too, but the more specific I get about, I really want to talk about this specific feeling, the specific situation. I want to talk about it in a very specific way. I want to do it in this specific sort of overlapping of styles. And you just think no one's going to like this. It's way too specific to me. That's what people like. Right? And then if, you, if you're like I am, then you have the fear that you're wasting time. I have a tremendous fear often of wasting time on projects. Yeah, yeah, I will. That's, that's a huge one, right? So we could, we could talk about that too. Cause I think about that all the time and, and I have a specific, do you want to get into this? Cause I have a specific. Yeah, method absolutely. Method. And I want to just remind people that they can find uh, Dan Barrett at no less than.com. And this is what we're talking about here. Mental modeling, creativity, mm -hmm. and you do, co you do coaching and things, but absolutely. Let's get into it. Yeah. So, so the, the, the way I think about this is, so the overarching mental model is this idea of convexity. Right. And so convexity is this basic idea that like for most and I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to summarize this in a very quick way. Right. But the way you can kind of think about it is for most experiments. Right. 
the potential downside is relatively small and the potential upside is large. So for example, if I, um, let's say I write a, a, an EP, so it's a five song, four song record or something. Mm -hmm. I might spend, let's say six, I'm just making this up. It'll take me seven years to write an EP, but let's say I'm actually productive and I do it in six months. So <laughs> six months, you write an EP. Right. The cost is, whatever it costs you to produce the EP and the six months, right? So you're out that, that is the sunk cost to produce it. The potential upside is massive fame and success and everybody loves you and blah, 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 blah. Now I'm not saying that that is likely, but what I'm saying is that there's a major mismatch in terms of potential upside versus potential downside. And so like the pursuit of convexity is this pursuit of situations in which you do that over and over and over again and are assured that though the majority of the things you do will fail, you only need to succeed once. So, mm -hmm. you know, for businesses, right? It's like, I mm -hmm. probably had like 13 business ideas right. and businesses that I started before I found the one that is what pays for my kids food and has, you know, pays for my employees, kids to go to college. And like, that's all you need. You just need the one, right? Uh, it is same with the record, right? Like I was in many bands before I was in Have a Nice Life. And in Have a Nice Life, we put out many things and we tried many things. And, you know, we had a MySpace profile and blah, 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 blah. And we did all these things that didn't work until one thing worked. And even that thing took 10 years to work. I've, you know? <laughs> I've heard this advice framed in a, in a succinct way not to... Um sort of minimize it, but it's sort of mm -hmm. this idea of like fail fast, work hard, do well, fail fast, learn, move on. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's not even, it, it, that's, that's definitely there. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also for me, what helps is not so much this idea of like, I've got to fail a million times. It's more, it's the certainty that like, okay, just statistically, if I can get up at bat enough times, yeah, I right. will hit a home run. Right. Sure. So what ends keep, up happening is like every, up, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, every failure gets reframed as, okay, I'm one closer. I'm one closer. I'm one closer. And if you're learning every time, that's what really helps. Right. The other mental model for that. So like, just have that in the background. Okay, cool. What I'm looking for is small experiments with relatively capped downsides that have high potential upsides. Mm -hmm. So when you have an idea, you scan it for those things. What, what's the downside? Is it capped? Right. So is it, is there a, a set amount I can lose that is safe for me to lose? So if I'm already, if I, let's say I'm already lost it, am I going to be okay? As long as that's fine. What's the potential upside is it high, right? Like what could go right if this really goes right. Right. So then if that's the background, I kind of divide my years or, or, you know, even quarters or lifetime or, you know, even parts of the day into this idea of like explore and exploit. So if you think about, let's say there's a spectrum, okay? On one side, you have exploration, which is you are just purely looking at new stuff. So you just moved into a new town. You want to find the best brunch place. So you're going to try every brunch place once. You got the whole list. You're just going down the list. Check, check, check. That's just pure exploration. Exploitation is on the opposite side where you're saying, I know what works. I'm going to optimize it right? So I'm going to lean into it all the way. I found my favorite brunch, brunch place. Now what's my favorite menu item? Now I found my favorite <laughs> menu item. How do I want my eggs? Over easy or fried? Well, you are going Over to just, medium every time. Yeah, you are going deep on this one, you know, like, uh, you know. I love this egg, obsession with scale. brunch. We have, what, you know, uh, total, totally about me for one minute. <laughs> when I, I'm a word guy and, yeah. and a playwright and all this, and uh, I remember vividly one of my memories as a child, one of my very first memories is quite literally hearing the word brunch for the first time. And I could not believe that there were, that uh, this portmanteau existed <laughs> and everyone was getting so excited. And I was obsessed with this, this brunch, you know, and anyway, it, know. It, to me, this is very you admit, It's one of the first ones too, where you're like, Oh, they just, they and just put the two cool. things together. <laughs> you can drink at this one, but not at this one. And it means yeah. special. It's just wonderful. Oh Humans God. are infinitely wow. creative. And yeah, we've got to fight for brunch. If, <laughs> uh, politics aside, just fight for brunch. People. This is the unifying thing. It's going to bring yeah. us all together. It's I, yeah, I think brunch. so. Yeah, who I doesn't believe, love I really, brunch? I, yeah, no, there's nobody. No, <laughs> there's nobody. There's nobody. I, I lived in England for a little while and their, and their breakfasts are so disappointing except for their Sunday roasts. And I would just, <laughs> I would just rave and I would just go, you've never had, this is, you know. 
All right. Well, <laughs> so in any case, all right. Yeah. So explore, exploit, right? So <laughs> exploitation is you're going deep, you're optimizing. Exploring is you're going through as many options as humanly possible, right? Mm-hmm. And what most people typically do when they have options that are on either side of the spectrum is they seek the the golden mean, right? So this is like Aristotle is like the golden mean is right in the middle. You're not too full and you're not too hungry. It's perfect. You know, it's like, that's what we kind of think we want. But for a lot of stuff, that's actually incredibly inefficient. And what ends up happening is you neither get the benefits, the full benefits of exploration, exploration, nor the full benefits of optimization and the exploitation thing. You're kind of like in the middle and everything's kind of, kind of bad. And this is, it happens in business. It happens in creativity. It's like you're trying to do two very different activities at the same time and it doesn't work. So what I will largely do is I will say, like, am I in explore mode or exploit mode, right? Mm. So like the beginning of this year, this whole first half of the year is all explore mode. Like no lesson was an experiment. The email list was an experiment. Uh, For a while I went live every single day. That was an experiment. I experimented with Twitter as a marketing platform for the first time. I experimented with different copywriting angles. I made an online course for the first time. I started a coaching program for the first time. These are all things I'm doing for the first time. How right? many hours a day do you work? Uh, I, not very much. I work like 8.30 to 4, four yeah. days a week or so. Consistently, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I, I just, um, I'm very, I don't do most things. Right. So I don't do a lot of stuff. You're, I just only do certain okay. things right. that I'm, I try to do only things that I'm good at. All right. Making stuff is one of the things that I'm good at. Right. Mm-hmm. So I can design a program and yada, yada, yada. And I can launch a thing and I'm bad at keeping it going, but mm. I can get it going, you know, uh-huh. very fast. Right. Sure. So, you know, but the, the thing with, so for example, the coaching program, right. It sounds very time consuming. It wasn't. What I did was I created a Facebook post that said, I'm starting a coaching program. I don't know what it is, but it's going to be cool. Who's in? And I made like 60 bucks. It was like 60 bucks a month. So it's cheap, right? All I want to do is test the idea. The idea that I'm exploring, right? The exploration is, do I like coaching? right? Okay. What types of coaching do I want? So I said, okay, we're going to have Voxer, which is like a walkie talkie app. Check in with me every day. You're going to send me one email a week. I gave them like a little, I made a couple online course videos for them. And I said, do the thing. There's a process I'm going to lead you through. It's like goal setting, you know, weekly goal setting, weekly check-in. It's like accountability. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to help you achieve whatever you're trying to achieve and go through the thing. Right. And, and so here's how this fits into this convexity idea, right? What is the potential downside? It's some lost time, probably some irritation. I didn't spend any money to promote it. I sent an email to my list or whatever, um, which is not a particularly large, mostly from people that know me from Twitter. And I said, cool, here's the thing. Here's what I'm trying to do. Do you want in? People signed up. I got some money. So I got like, you know, whatever it is. I think I signed four people up. I'm like, cool, that's, that's fine. I closed it. And I said, cool, we're going to run this for two months. Mm-hmm. Get so the there's a and yeah. there's a cap on it. I know exactly how much time I'm gonna spend on it and experimenting with it, right? And so what I learned was I do really like coaching. I did not like doing the walkie-talkie thing. The weekly check-in thing was great, but I it's way uh, it's too time-consuming for the amount of money I'm charging for it. So I'm like, okay, cool. Now that I know that, if I want to keep doing this, what do I now know? I need to charge way more for this. It needs to have a much clearer outcome. Like I've learned so much through the short experiment of launching this thing, right? Similarly, like writing the weekly email, that was an experiment. The experiment was, I don't even know if I could write a weekly email. Maybe I won't have anything to talk about. Maybe I won't be able to keep up with the work. Like I just literally was like, I don't even know if I could do it. And so I said, okay, I'm going to do it for three months. I'm going to just tell people I'm doing it. Like I went on Facebook. I was like, I'm doing a thing. (laughs) <laughs> Sign up for the thing. I'm doing the thing. And, it, and it's still free at no less than dot com. Right? It's still free. Up, yeah, yeah. You can, you can go to a better questions, email.com and sign up directly for okay. it. Or you can go to no less than doesn't matter, but you can go there, sign up for it. It'll be once a week. And again, so here's the thing, capping the downside. You know exactly what I'm on the hook for. I'm, I'm only going to do it for three months. I'm going to see if I like it. Here, here we go. And in the course of doing it, I was like, Oh, I love it. I love it. I want to do this. And from the email came the process I built to make the email. I made into a course and then sold the course. 
made back enough money to make all my time doing the email work, right? And then from doing the course came the idea of doing the coaching. So this is all an exploration mode, right? Right. Now, now you're back going, half of this uh -huh. year. Okay. I'm I'm like, I'm starting to feel like this is a little too much exploration. I've been wandering the seven seas all, all year and I don't know what I'm doing. I'm doing a million different things. You, I can just kind of feel like it's time. So what am I going to do? I'm doing 80, 20 analysis, right? 20% of the stuff I'm doing is producing 80% of the results. What do I want to keep? What do I want to cut? Clear everything on my plate. Everything is not working. I'm like, I'm not doing it. I, I was going live every day. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it anymore. Sure. I might go live a little bit less. It's just too much time, right? I'm going to keep the email. I'll probably keep the coaching, but it's going to be way more expensive. So I'll probably right. just end up shutting it down, right? Mm. I'm going to keep this. I'm going to get rid of that. So I'm going to clear my calendar of all this stuff. And then I'm going to lean way into how do I take the things that are working and just drive them all the way 100% optimized, right? And, is and this, if you just yeah. follow that process over right. and over and over again, experiment, find what works, optimize, and then go back. Once you, once you kind of have it off your plate, it, um, mm -hmm. it allows you to make massive progress very quickly. Wow. So, yeah. I think it's great advice. I mean, is that how you grew AdWords Nerds too? Is it Pretty much, yeah. AdWords yeah. Nerds was the result of an experiment. So I had, been, I had started freelancing. I had success freelancing with like local businesses that led me to quit my job and just do freelancing full time. Yeah. It took me like two years to even figure out what the heck I was doing freelancing. I still don't, didn't really know, but at some point I was like, okay, I need um, a market to focus on. And so originally I picked like, cause I was doing local businesses. That wasn't enough. Yeah. Then I switched to like dentists. I'm like, I don't like dentists. There. It's real hard. It's really competitive. <laughs> dentists are fine. No, nobody but, likes you know, the dentist. Fine. Nobody likes going to the dentist. Yeah, but right. you know, but it, it was like no shade there, there were a lot of there's a lot of competition for dentists. So it's sure. like I don't want to do dentists. I switched to naturopathic doctors that actually went a lot better. There was much less competition. But I was like, yeah. so like two years working with naturopathic doctors before I was like, hey, you know what naturopathic doctors hate is money, and I'm trying to sell them marketing, and they are such like do-gooders. And I mean this in the best possible sense of the word. They want to make the world a better place. They think money is evil. And so it's like, they're all emotionally conflicted about marketing. And I would be like, Hey, you should fix your website. And they'd be like, yeah, you know, and I was like, Oh, it's <laughs> right, right. crazy. Yeah. So, so I, at that point I said, I had one client. I, um, I, I took a bunch of different random clients just looking for what clicked. I found a client that was in real estate, yeah. uh, a real estate investor who are my clients now. And I was like, this worked really well. I got you really good um, results. Can you give me a couple of referrals? I got three real estate investor clients. That went really well. And I was like, this is the thing. And that's about seven years ago now. So it, it's this, this process of try a bunch of stuff, find something that works or that you like, and then really lean into it while all along the way, just making sure, and this I think a big mistake that people make, not like I didn't quit my job when I started freelancing. Mm -hmm. I freelanced while I was doing my job and only quit when it went well enough, right? Mitigating and I didn't risk. jump into every industry. I yeah. tried it out with a couple of clients first, right? It's cap your downside while looking for that convex upside. And um, it, it has just been a, 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 a methodology and approach to life that's really worked for me. And I was just say like, yeah. I, uh, I'm not any smarter than anybody else. I work much less hard than most people. I just, uh, I don't know, just refuse to stop trying random stuff and it kind of just works out. So I'm like, this way, you don't need to be smart. You can just stay alive as long as possible and it'll work out. And that's my whole strategy. That is a very Dan Barrett statement. Uh, Dan, can you plug your stuff here at the end? Of course. Yeah. So yeah. you can, um, so no less than.com is the website for mental models and, uh, productivity and lifestyle design and all that stuff. I would love for people to go there. They can sign up for the better questions email there. That's really what I would love. You can follow me on Twitter at enemies list. And, um, yeah, I, I plug all my stuff there. So if you want to go hear about running an agency or hear what I'm thinking, that's a great place to find me as well. Yeah. And of course the new black wing album coming out, no moon, Yes, you're that. doing a better job of the promo than I. Yeah, I just forget. I'm, yeah, no, that's I do have a record right. coming out this year. Yeah, yeah. No under, under the yeah. Blackwing moniker, you'll be able to get that on Spotify yeah. and everything. All right. 
And I'm Kevin Kautzman, and this is the Get This Podcast. It's the show about things people love. It's at getthispodcast.com. And then all the usual places you can find podcasts, uh, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify. And Dan, really grateful for your time and just such a ple- uh, pleasure um, uh, chatting with you. And uh, thanks for all the music. And I can't wait for more. Yeah, thank and you. And all the ideas. Really and the What's writing. That? And the oh, ideas and, and the, the writing, writing. and the mm-hmm. writing. You're you're a, you're an extraordinarily strong writer. The the lyrics uh, are incredible. The writing on the the coaching website. I think when people hear coaching website, mm-hmm. they think of a certain set of things, and your writing is is not those things. So yeah. highly recommend. Well, oh, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, that that makes me feel really good uh, coming for you for sure. So uh, yeah, thanks, man. I really appreciate you having me. Okay, Dan. Let's chat soon. Take care. Thanks. All right.